that means it's Friday Eve. And we are going to read some more of Valley of the Dolls. We have to read it quickly because this book I had to get from a library all the way in Georgia. I put in the order with my local library and I'm not able to renew it. So we have to get through it quickly. Normally I would savor it a little more, but that's life. Here is my shout out, is my lip balm. I bought a whole pack. There was probably 12 in a package at on the checkout line at Burlington Coat Factory. And I needed lip balm because I'm putting it on my little spot. Every winter I get that split in my cuticle and this lip balm has been the only answer. So I've been going through a lot of lip balm. And this one is Pixie Stick Strawberry. And yeah, it does smell like strawberry. It tastes good, a little bit too good. It's very sweet. And I bought a bottle of premium lotion at Burlington Coat Factory, Factory also. It does not have any fragrance. So that's pretty much why I bought it. And it was inexpensive, $3.99. And this is my follow-up on my product placement from the other day. These were a big hit. I ate a good number of them before I even made it to the party. <laughs> but it's amazing what a toothpick will do. A toothpick and an olive is like an hors d'oeuvre. And it's only an olive. But anyway, <laughs> let's just dig right in to Jacqueline Suzanne Valley of the Dolls. Let's, we'll try to get done. Hopefully that construction will be not a problem today. But anyway, we'll do our best. We're up to page 218 now. She was in a robe when Tony arrived. Hey, hurry and get dressed. The show goes on at 1230. She came to him. Hold me first, she said softly. When he broke the embrace, he gasped. Baby, let me come up for air. Jesus, I need a blood transfusion just being near you. His hand stroked her breast. His fingers fumbled with the buttons on her satin robe. Jesus, how do you wear robes with so many buttons? He pulled the robe off her shoulders, down to her waist. He stood back. His breath came faster. Jen, no, no one should have boobs like that. He touched them lightly. She smiled. They're yours, Tony. He buried his face in them, sinking to his knees. Oh, God, I just can't believe it. Every time I touch them, I can't believe it. His mouth was greedy. She held his head gently. I never want to move, he mumbled. Tony, let's get married. Sure, baby, sure. He was fumbling at the rest of the buttons on her robe. It fell to the floor. She backed away. He crawled on his knees after her. She backed away again. Tony, all of this, she stroked her body, is not yours. It's mine. He came after her. She eluded him again. She stroked her thighs, her fingers touching between her legs. That's mine, too, she said softly. But we want you, Tony, she whispered hoarsely. Take your clothes off. He tore at his shirt. The buttons ripped and fell to the floor. He stood before her naked. Your body is nice, she said with a slow smile. Then she backed away. But mine is nicer. She stroked her breast deliberately, almost as if she thrilled to the touch. He stood watching her breathe, breathe, his breath coming in quickly, quickly gasped. He rushed to her and she backed away. You can look, she said softly, but you can't touch, not until it's yours. But it is mine. You're mine, his voice almost was a growl. Only alone, she smiled sweetly. I'm taking it back unless you really want it. She stroked her breast again. Want it for keeps. He followed her, trembling. I do. Just come to me now. Not now, not until you marry me. Sure, he said hoarsely, I'll marry you. He kept following her, but she eluded him, smiling all the while and stroking her body, letting her hands play with her breasts, sliding them to her legs and touching herself. Her eyes were riveted to him. When will you marry me, Tony? We'll talk about it later, right after. He kept after her, hypnotized by his new game she was playing. She let, let him reach her. He grabbed at her breast. His mouth sucked at them hungrily. His hands reached between her legs. Then she pulled away. Jen, he gasped, stop it. What are you trying to do, kill me? Marry me, or that was the last time you touch me, ever. I will, I will, now, tonight. 
How can we get married tonight? We have to take blood tests. We need a license. We'll start that jazz first thing tomorrow, I promise. No, by then Miriam will talk you out of it. Mentioning Miriam was the wrong move. It snapped him back to reality. His passion began to dissolve. Quickly, she moved across the room, undulating her body, caressing her breast. We'll miss you, Tony, she whispered. He crossed the room quickly and grabbed her. Marry us tonight, Tony. We want to belong to you, she rubbed against him. How can I, he whined. Get your car. We could drive to Elkton, Maryland. He start, stared at her. You mean they marry us just like that? Just like that, she snapped her fingers. But Miriam, I'll tell Miriam, she said. We'll call her after we're married. I'll tell her. Let her yell at me. You'll be in my arms. All of me will belong to you forever. She moved her body against him. Touch me, Tony. It will belong to you. You'll be able to do anything you want to me, Tony. Anything. Even the things I wouldn't let you do. She she broke away and stood swaying, her hips moving rhythmically. And I'll do all the things you begged me to do after we're married. Now, he begged, now, please, then we'll go to Elkton. No, after Elkton. I can't stand it. I can't wait until then. She came close. Yes, you can, because tonight after we're married, she let her fingers caress his body, nibbled at his ear. Then we'll have a ball. His lips were dry. Okay, you win, only for Christ's sakes. Let's get going. She threw her arm around him. You won't regret it. I'll make you wild. There was a sharp knock on the door. Jennifer broke the embrace. I'm not expecting a soul, Tony. Did you tell anyone we'd be here? He shook his head. She pulled on her robe. It was an apologetic bellboy with a telegram. It's for Anne. I'd better phone her at Leon's. It might be important. She sat on the bed and called Anne. Tony came into the bedroom. Oh, God, this is a stupid thing to do. She stood up, clutching a robe around her. There was, where was Anne? Why didn't they answer? Hello, it was Leon. Yes, he'd get in to... Hi, good in, lunatic friend. How are you? Um, it was Leon. Yes, he'd get in. Tony was fumbling at her robe. She pushed him away. Hello, Anne. A telegram, a telegram just came for you. Sure, one second. She ripped it open. Tony gently but firmly pushed her on the bed. She held the telegram and the phone and silently tried to push him off. She clasped her hands over the phone. No, Tony, not now, no. The, he was on top of her. She looked at the wire. Tony's mouth found her breast. Oh, God, Ann. Yes, I'm here, Ann. Good Lord, your mother is dead. She felt Tony enter her, roughly pounding into her. She clenched her teeth and kept her voice even. Yes, Ann, that's all it says. I'm terribly sorry. She hung up. Tony had fallen across her, panting and satisfied exhaustion. Tony, that wasn't fair. That was taking advantage of me. He smiled lazily. Baby, you were born with advantages, a pair of them. He flicked her breast lightly. We'd better get dressed. Anne is coming back here. He pulled on his shirt. Christ, I was hot for you, wasn't I? No buttons left on his shirt. I'll run back to the hotel and grab a new shirt. Pack a bag, Tony. What for? We're going to Maryland, remember? He smiled. Not now, baby. If we hurry, we can still catch part of the show at La Bambra. Now be dressed when I come back in about 20 minutes. Tony, if we don't elope tonight, I'll never see you again. He walked over and chucked her playfully under the chin. You'll see me, baby. I'm the greatest. Who could replace me? We walked to the door. He walked to the door. Wear something gorgeous. The newspaper men will be there. She watched the door close. Damn, damn, what timing. Damn Anne's mother. Damn all mothers. Even in death, they'd reach out and lash you up. She suddenly remembered she hadn't sent her mother a check this week, and Christmas was coming up. Her mother had seen a Parisian lamb coat, and she had to have it. She wanted one fur coat before she died. She rushed to the desk and scribbled a check for $500, stuck it in an envelope, and wrote, Merry Christmas, Happy Persian Lamb, Jeanette. Well, at least her mother would have a Merry Christmas. Damn it, it when would she have one? She began to dress quickly. She didn't want to be here when Tony came by. She had to force his hand. There was no, there was so little time. She'd go to Lawrenceville with Anne, of course. She owed it to Anne as a friend. She called Henry Bellamy. His sleepy voice became alert when she told him the news. Of course, she was going along with Anne. Don't worry. He, he'd handle Gil Case. She was to hire a car and charge it to his account. 
it would be easier to drive to Lawrenceville than bother with train connection. Poor Anne, and Aunt, and Mother all in one year. When Anne and Leon arrived, everything had been arranged. Jennifer had packed Anne's overnight bag. I put in two black dresses in your gray suit. We can take an early train in the morning, Anne said. No, it's only 12.30 and I never sleep anyway. I'll drive. You can sleep in the car. We'll be there in the morning. I've ordered the car. It should be downstairs any second. I'll come up for the funeral, Leon said. She turned to him. No, Leon, you didn't know, Mother. It'll be all right. Use the time on the book. Call me the minute you arrive. Jennifer rushed them downstairs. The attendant was waiting with, shiny black, with a shiny black sedan. He gave Jennifer the keys and registration, and five minutes later, they were on their way. Leon watched the taillights disappear into the traffic. It had all happened so quickly. He was amazed at Jennifer's take charge attitude. He had misjudged her. She wasn't at all fluff after all. He walked down the street just missing Tony Polar, who jauntily pulled up in a cab. The funeral was held on Monday, once they were in Lawrenceville. Anne took over and coolly made all the arrangements. It had been a senseless accident, her mother's fault. She was getting cataracts. Aunt Amy had always done the driving, yet after Amy's death, she had insisted on driving herself. It had been a rainy night. She was returning from a duplicate bridge game. At church, she hadn't seen the trailer truck. It had been a head-on crash, and her mother had died instantly. The funeral had been a serene and dignified. Leon and Henry sent huge floral offerings. Miss Steinberg and the girls all sent a wreath. Later that evening, Anne went through all the formalities of receiving. Everyone in town came to express sympathy and to gape at Jennifer. On Tuesday morning, Jennifer brought up the subject of returning to New York. They were sitting in the sunny breakfast room. Jennifer enjoyed, enjoyed Lawrenceville. She had been amused at the town's bulgy-eyed admiration, but most of all, she was impressed with the large house that belonged to Anne. I have to get back to the show, she said, but I imagine you want to stay here for a while. Whatever for, Anne said. Jennifer looked around. Well, this house, you just can't up and leave it. I've already spoken to my lawyer. Lawyer, I told him to put it up for sale, furniture and all. But it's a wonderful house, Anne. Maybe you should keep it, rent it. I hate it. I hate this town. I want to cut every tie. If I keep this house, they'd always have a reason. I'd always have a reason to have to return. If I sell it, I know I never, never have to come back. Was your childhood that awful? Not awful, just nothing. I take it you didn't love your mother? No, I didn't love her. I didn't dislike her. I never gave me uh, I never gave me a chance to do either. It wasn't her fault. It was Lawrenceville. Oh, Jennifer, I'd rather live with my whole life in the one dreary room I used to have on 52nd Street than stay here. Lawrenceville strangles me. I can't feel it closing in on me. She shuddered. Imagine in all my life, here I knew at least 30 girls, but not one became a close friend. I've been in New York just over a year, and I've got you and Neely and Leon. Well, you've got Leon and me. We haven't heard from our movie star in months. Her picture opens in March. Imagine her first picture opening at the music hall. Well, she must be good in it. I read where she's already at work on the second. Wonder when the babies will start. And Mel, do you think he's gained any weight? They both laughed, and Jennifer poured some more coffee. Well, I've got to get le I've got to leave this afternoon. That will get me back late tonight. At least I can make the matinee tomorrow. Her brow creased. God, Tony probably thinks I've been kidnapped. I've left no word at the hotel. Marion must be celebrating. She thought about Tony during the momentous drive back to New York. Even if things worked out, if they did get married, there'd always be Miriam. It was a blind spot with Tony. She raised me. She's, she's raised me, given her whole life to me. He'd yell at Jennifer, balked at Miriam, an eternal intrusion. She's the only dame who's 100% for me. But Miriam couldn't go to bed with him. Jennifer's face set. It wasn't just his money and security she wanted. She also wanted to be a good wife. She wanted a child. Tony would get more than he bargained for. She wouldn't cheat on him. Cheat for what? One man was the same as another. Tony could satisfy her. Most men could. Maria had taught her about her body, and she knew how to get aroused. It was easy. Her box at the hotel was crammed with messages from 
Some were from Longworth Agency, oh God, she had forgotten to notice by them, but the rest were from Tony. The switchboard operator informed her that Mr. Poehler had just called for the 10th time that day. Jennifer smiled in satisfaction. It was two in the morning. She went to her suite and undressed, but she didn't take a sec second off. She got into bed and waited. 20 minutes later, the phone rang. She could hear the relief in Tony's voice when she answered. Then he growled, where the hell have you been? Away, no kidding. Then his tone changed in a sudden rush of emotion. He said, listen, baby, I've been half out of my mind. Where were you? He was not appeased when she told him, nor was he fully convinced. Since when do you go rushing out of town to attend funerals? Anne is my best friend. All right, but you sure stayed away a hell of a long time. What happened? Was one of the ball bearers handsome? They all were, she said sweetly. As a matter of fact, I've never seen so many good-looking men in one town. She hadn't even talked to a man under 50. Jenny said softly, can I come over? Tony, it's almost 3 o'clock. I could be there in five minutes. She forced a yawn. Sorry, I'm bushed. Tomorrow then, early in the afternoon, I have a recording session at 3, but I'll be through at, through at 4. I have a matinee. It's Wednesday, remember? All right, I'll come to your place after the matinee. No, you just know I keep my makeup on between shows and it would ruin my hair. He groaned, all right, all right. I'll come by and take you to dinner. We'll see. She hung up. She didn't go home after the matinee. She forced herself to sit through a movie between shows. And e at the evening performance, she told the doorman to say he had gone. she had gone if Tony arrived after the show to pick her up. She sat in the dressing room until the doorman came by to lock up. Yes, Mr. Poehler had come by, and he had given the message like she said. She gave him five dollars and walked home. The phone was ringing when she let herself into the apartment. She let it ring. It rang every 20 minutes. Each time she checked with the operator, it was always Mr. Poehler. At five in the morning, she finally picked up the phone on the third ring. He was enraged. Where have you been? I went to a movie between shows, she deliberately made it sound like a lie. Oh, sure, and tonight, oh, you sure must have lit out of there fast. I was there, the doorman must have made a mistake. And I suppose you've been home all evening? Mm -hmm. Well, for your information, I've called every 20 minutes since 11.30. You just got home, he sounded triumphant. I must have been sleeping and didn't hear the phone. I'll bet, probably one of those Boston swells you met at the funeral. He, she hung up on him and lay back with a beautific smile. It was working. She went into the bathroom and took out the bottle, a bottle brimming with red pills. What a windfall. In Lawrenceville, she had innocently told old Dr. Rogers about her sleeping problem. He'd been blinded by her sunny smile. He was sympathetic and understanding. Funerals often gave people insomnia. The next day, he had appeared with a little bottle crammed with 25 seconds. She heard the insistent ring of the phone again. Tony would keep at it. She told the operator not to ring anymore, to say she was accepting no more calls for the evening. As an extra precaution, she pulled the safety bolt across the door. Then she opened the bottle of pills. She took two of them. One worked, but two, it was the most beautiful feeling in the world. When she put her head on the pillow gently, the soft numbness began to slither through her body. Oh, God, how had she ever lived without these gorgeous red dolls? She played the cat-mouse game with Tony for two more days. Each night, she looked at the bottle of second dolls with affection. She never could do this without the dolls. She would have, slept, she would have spent sleepless nights smoking, worrying, and she would have lost her nerve. On Friday night, Tony was standing at the stage entrance when she arrived at the theater. He grabbed her arm roughly. Okay, you win, he snarled. I have the car. We leave for Elfton tonight. Now. But I have a show and a matinee tomorrow. I'll go in and tell the stage manager you're sick. But they'll read all about it in the papers tomorrow if we elope. I'll be fired, maybe brought up on charges at equity. So what? You'll be Mrs. Tony Poehler. You don't intend to keep on working in the show, do you? Of course not. Was she crazy? Besides, Henry, Henry would smooth everything over. That was it. She grabbed his arm. Go tell him I'm sick, Tony. As a matter of fact, I am beginning to feel faint. Jennifer was happy. Tony was dazed. They were married. 
the Elkton newspapers had been informed. They had posed and smiled for the local cameramen and given statements for the AP and UP. Finally, they had driven off and checked into a small hotel in out of, out, um, outskirts of the city. Now, as Tony sat on the bed watching Jennifer unpack, the numbness created by the excitement be began to wear off. He was suddenly frightened. Marion will kill me, he said slowly. Jennifer came over and put her arms around him. You're not a child, Tony. You're my husband. You've got to stick by me when we tell her, he mumbled. I'm your wife, darling. I'll always stick by you. But she'll be so mad, Jen. Tears came into his eyes. Suddenly, he buried his head in the pillow and sobbed. I'm scared. Oh, I'm so scared. For a moment, Jennifer stood very still. A wave of revulsion sickened her. She felt a crazy impulse to turn and run. But where? And to what? No one would understand. They'd think something was wrong with her. She, made, she had to make this work. Tony was a star and a talented people had idiosyncrasies. Maybe that was it. He was just more emotional than most men. She sat on the bed and crad cradled his head in her arms. It's going to be all right, Tony, she said softly. But Marion will be mad. She's, she'll holler. He looked at her, his eyes brimming with tears. It's your fault. You made me do it. I told you I'll stand up to marry him. Honest, you really will? Yes, she stroked his head. Just remember that I'm your wife. He reached out and touched her breast. Slowly, he wiped away his tears and began to grin. He looked at her slyly, and now I can do anything I want with you. She managed a weak smile. Yes, Tony. He pulled the robe off her. Turn over, he growled. She ground her teeth in agony as he tore into her. She felt his nails ripping down her back. Smile, Jen, she told herself. You've made it. You're Mrs. Tony Polar. Miriam held the crumpled wire and stared vacantly into space. Elkton. Well, that was it. And she had taken every precaution. Two hundred a week she paid that Ornsby. She picked up the phone, her fat finger tearing viciously at the dial. Sorry to disturb your sleep, Mr. Ornsby, she smiled. Just, but it just so happens you're sleeping on my time. He was instantly alert. I followed him to the stage door at 8. He was waiting for her. She came along at 8.01, and they stood talking. It was almost half an hour time, and I knew she had to go in, so I went off and grabbed a bite. I knew I was safe for three hours. She had the show to do. Then I showed up again at 11. He didn't come around. If he's going to pick her up, he gets there by 11.15 at the latest. I waited till 11.30, then I took my post at his hotel. I just left a few hours ago. He hadn't come in. I checked all the clubs. He's not around, so I figured maybe she had another date tonight, and he shacked up with some other chick. She's been ducking him for several nights, running home alone after each show. Well, she didn't go. She didn't do no show tonight, Miriam snapped. They eloped. There was a silence on the other end of the line. Two hundred a week I've been paying you just to prevent this. What kind of detective are you? One of the best, he said sharply. But those two are fruitcakes. I froze him my ass off standing outside his hotel night after night while they were up in bed, all warm and cozy, banging away. But hell, lady, I'm not the FBI. I got to eat and I got to stop sometimes to take a leak. I figure the only time I'm really safe is when that broad is on stage. Who figures she's going to sh skip a show? Marion slammed the receiver down, but he was right. Jennifer had been too sick. She sighed. She had been so careful, and now it would all probably go up in smoke. So far, the public and everybody had been fooled. They accepted Tony's childish replies as part of his charm. Some even thought it was clever, a clever pose. Only Marion knew, knew the truth, and she had hidden it from everyone, even Tony. With a woman, he functioned as a man physically. His talent as a performer was a gift. He did everything right when he sang automatically. But mentally and emotionally, Tony was 10 years old. Now what? As long as she was present at every interview, she could cover for him. But now there was Jennifer. How much had Jennifer guessed? Actually, she had nothing against the girl. She was probably generally, genuinely attracted to Tony. Why not? He was handsome and talented and quite a stallion. 
Maybe she hadn't noticed anything. After all, they were never alone, except for the sex. She had seen to that, always being with them, seeing to it that at least one or two of the writers always trailed along. She had trained Tony that way. A star always has an entourage, she had told him repeatedly, and he had accepted traveling with groups as a standard procedure. That way no one ever really got to do much talking with him. Until Jennifer, it had been easy. Miriam knew he had to satisfy his physical needs, and she encouraged it, always managing to keep it on the transitory basis. A dancer in the line at a club they played, happy to be with him, out for the kicks and reflected glory and satisfied to let him go out on of her life with a gift of perfume and his promises of undying affection. That's the way it had been until he met Jennifer. She had done everything to break that up. Every time he went out of town, she practically threw the most beautiful girls in the world in his arms. He took them, too, but he always came back to Jennifer. She had been hoping the California trip would finish it. Only two weeks to go, and now this. Miriam sighed. Most people thought she tagged after Tony to re revel in his reflected glory, some glory she had given anything for a life of her own, but she couldn't leave Tony, so here she was, a 44-year-old virgin, masterminding Tony into a spectacular success. Why did it have to be like this? The sins of the father, she thought wryly. Well, they had visited Tony all right, only he didn't know it. She was bearing the brunt, and it hadn't really been the sins of the father, but her lousy tramp of a mother. So many secrets she had hidden from Tony and from the world. She had spun a beautiful picture of a handsome father who had been killed in a train accident before Tony was born, and a lovely, frail mother so weakened by the shock that after she had given birth to little Tony, she had quietly smiled and passed into the arms of the angels, leaving the 14-year-old Miriam to take care of him. The press believed it. Tony believed it. He had never learned his real, who, that his real father, like Miriam's real father, had been a mystery even to their mother. They had been sired by different fathers, strangers who passed through their mother's arms from night to night, and the one who had produced Tony must have been a beaut. But then her mother ran into a lot of strange ducks. A singing waitress at Coney Island did not exactly draw the social register. Her mother had sworn Miriam's father was a nice man from Pittsburgh, perhaps, but Tony's father, whoever the bastard was, must have been good-looking. Tony had come off with the best of both parents. He had his mother's deep brown eyes with the incredible lashes. His nose was short and straight. His mouth was sensuous, and he was tall. Miriam, on the other hand, had inherited someone else's look. She smiled wryly. The guy from Pittsburgh might have been a very nice man, but he sure was no Robert Taylor. In fact, if she ever ran into a short, stout man with small blue eyes and big, bulbous nose in Pittsburgh, she'd holler, Daddy. <laughs> she had selected the name Polar out of sentiment, the kindest and most permanent lover, lover her mother had known was a man named Polarski. He had genuinely liked the pudgy little girl and never failed to bring her a present or chuck her under the chin. She had never forgotten him. Years later, as a silent tribute, she'd shortened her name and took it for herself and Tony. It hadn't been hard to hide this true identity from Tony or the press. The mother had been a drifter. Every city has a woman like Belle, and not the not-quite-young girl who played a tired piano and sings in a throaty voice in a local cocktail bar. Uh, Belle had started out singing at Tony Polar's, but that was the only shining hour of her career. Then she floated to the cocktail bars and beer halls around different cities, passing from man to man. Miriam was born in, cha in, ch in a charity ward in Philadelphia. Belle placed her in a foster home until she was eight. Then Belle fell into what seemed like a job of some permanence in Coney Island and sent for the girl. For a few years, Miriam knew the luxury of a two-room flat and the affection of Mr. Polarski, but when Polarski went his way, there was a succession of men. Belle was getting older. They were both stunned when Belle found she was pregnant again. Christ, she had, hadn't had the curse in months. All she needed was a change of life, kid. She stayed on the job for six months, then the costume could no longer conceal her condition, and she was fired. They moved to one room. Miriam, now 14, quit school and got a job as a counter girl. They had no friends, no neighbors. 
Then, late one night, when the ambulance clanging bell was rushed to the hospital with the trembling Miriam at her side, Bell fi died five minutes after the screaming boy entered the world. Miriam had taken the baby home. It had been easy to convince the disinterested hospital supervisor that there was a grandmother waiting to take over. And all alone, the 14-year-old girl had raised Tony. It seemed impossible when she looked back. The dreadful early weeks trying to make the formula correctly, washing diapers, trying to make the $200. She and Belle had saved, stretch out, counting out pennies from milk living on cans of soup and big boxes of crackers. Tony had been four weeks old when he had the first convulsion. Again, there was a clanging ambulance. The hospital tests were made, and he and all the big doctors studied Tony's case. They kept him in the hospital a year. Miriam was frantic with worry, but at least she was able to get a full-time job and save some money. Then Tony was returned to her. He looked healthy. Then more convulsions and back to the hospital. It went on like that until he was five. Then the convulsions stopped. He went to kindergarten, struggled through the first grade. In the second grade, they threw him out. They suggested a special school, but she kept him home. Her Tony wasn't going to be with a lot of crazy kids. Patiently, she taught him herself as much as she could learn. Yes, it had been an impossible beginning, but at 15, one can fight for... But at 15... One can fight for survival against any odds. At 21, could take on the world, but now the odds were piling up again and Miriam was tired. A few times she had even considered going to Jennifer and telling her the truth about Tony, so she would understand the idea of marriage with Tony was senseless, but it was too big a gamble. Suppose the girl had turned on both of them, told the story around town. It would destroy Tony's career and that would destroy Tony. She couldn't give up now. She had fought too long and too hard. God, she even fought for the United States Army. Tony had been elated when he received his draft notice. It was like playing soldier to him. His career was just starting, and he never knew about the secret tip, secret trips she had taken to Washington, the endless red tape, and the lack of sensitivity of the Army brass. She had been ready to give up until she met Major Beckman and his brother, like, and he had a brother like Tony. He read Tony's medical reports and bound in a frayed manila envelope from the hospital in Coney Island. He had Tony examined by his chief neurologist. Finally, Mar Miriam received a new collection of reports to add to the manila envelope, and Tony was rejected by the ar Army quietly and firmly. Major Beckman announced to the press that Tony had been rejected due to a punctured eardrum. No, she couldn't give up now. She had fought off the army, the press, the whole damn world. One sleeky, slinky blonde wasn't going to ruin everything. Hi, how are you? She's, she'd stick close to them. They were leaving for the coast in a few weeks, and she'd be living with them. Who knows? It might work out somehow. She pulled the robe around her shapeless body and resolutely organized her thoughts. She had to notify the press, the columnist, who should get, whom she should give the first break to. No, don't play favorites. The wire services must have picked up on it already from Elkton. When they returned, she'd call a press conference, arrange interviews with Jennifer and Tony. Wow, we're up to the next chapter, which is titled Anne, December 1946. That night, Anne returned to New York. She found everything in wild disarray. A note written in Jennifer's hurried scrawl was propped on the night table. It was a tough fight, but I won. When you read this, I will be Mrs. Tony Poehler. Wish me luck, love, Jen. She was glad for Jennifer, but Jennifer's victory seemed to emphasize the dreariness of her own situation. Leon had called her in Lawrenceville to tell her the great news. Bess Wilson loved the book, thought it was had great promise, but felt it needed a complete rewrite before she could show it to any publisher. Leon was very enthusiastic. Sure, it meant another six months at the typewriter, but Bess Wilson liked it, and Bess was tough to please. She had tried to hide her disappointment. Six months of rewriting, and now Jennifer was gone. The hotel suite seemed so empty. She could carry it alone. She had plenty of money, or would have, as soon as everything was, un was in order. Unfortunately, serving all tie, severing all ties with Lawrenceville could not be accomplished just by handing Mr. Walker the keys. There were endless legal adjustments that required her presence. 
the will had to be probated formally, and the furniture couldn't just, she couldn't just dump it on the sidewalk. Mr. Walker said every piece was worth something. It had to be tagged and sent to New York or Boston for auction. It would bring her a good deal of money. Her mother had left her $50,000 in bonds, cash, and stock. And Amy's money also went to her $25,000 more. Mr. Walker thought she should get $40,000 for the house alone, since it was on an acre and a half of good ground. Yes, she would have plenty of money, well over 100000 not counting the furniture. But meanwhile, there was still the necessity of returning to Lawrenceville for at least another week, perhaps longer. She shuddered. Just being in that house made her feel unreasonably depressed. She took a quick shower, changed her clothes, and took a cab to Leon's apartment. He was at the typewriter when she arrived, came into the, jun Come into the dungeon, he said, embracing her warmly. He began picking up some crumpled pages he had tossed on the floor. Don't mind this rubbish. I've been working every evening. It's coming along swimmingly. She forced a smile. I'm glad, Leon. I know it will be a good book. She picked up a sheaf of the new pages and glanced at them. This is no time for me to be trapped in Lawrenceville, but I can take some of it back with me and type it up in a clean copy. What would I do without you? My typing looks like hieroglyphics. Suddenly he frowned. It really isn't fair to you. You've been so patient. And now another delay, this bloody rewrite. She smiled. I told you I'd wait forever, if necessary. Don't mind me and my mood, Leon. It's just Lawrenceville. Later, as, he lay, as she lay in his arms, Lawrenceville seemed thousands of miles away, as if it had never happened. And it wasn't until later that she even remembered to tell Leon the news about Jennifer. I'm glad for her, he said, but doesn't that leave you a bit of leave you in a bit of a fix, no roommate? I have money, Leon. Mother left me quite a bit. Don't tell anyone. Some fortune hunter will grab you off. Leon, why can't we get married? I have enough for us to live on for well for a long time. And you'd get up every morning and go to work. Only to keep out of your hair. Uh it'll be too cramped here for both of us hanging about, but once you made it then I'd work for you. I'd type your manuscripts, hand you your fan mail, handle your fan mail. It doesn't work that way, Anne. You know what Thefts Wilson said. Even if it's a good book, it might do nothing more than earn me a slight reputation. Then I'd have another year's work with no money coming in, and I don't think I would like to write full time. These past few evening, evenings have proved something to me. You get a certain rhythm when you keep at a thing hours on end. Then I'm right, she sat up. And wrong, I have some money, Anne. But the, by the time I was into my next book, it would run out. I'd be coming to you for cigarette money. I'd be too humiliated to write. No, darling, it wouldn't work. But what am I supposed to do? Sit around and wait until you win a Pulitzer Prize? No, just wait and see how this book is received. If it's received at all, I have no real assurance I'll even get published. You will. I know you will. And I'll wait. She looked thoughtful. How long does it take to get a book published, I wonder? He laughed and took her in his arms. Anne paced up and down the wooden planks of the Lawrenceville station. As usual, the local train was late. Poor Leon, the five-hour train ride to Boston was deadly enough. But to sit on the unheated local for an hour with all those stops? The last three days had certainly been deadly for her. She had even been grateful for Willie Henderson, who had driven her everywhere in the, his new Chevy. There was such red tape connected with every detail, and sometimes it seemed that nothing had been accomplished. She would have to remain throughout through part of next week so that the dealer from Boston could come to discuss the furnishings. Everything had to be discussed. Every move she made was stymied by slow legal procedure. She was trapped in Lawrenceville. But Leon was coming up for the weekend. They'd have two wonderful days together, and for those two days, even Lawrenceville wouldn't be pal would be pal palatable. For the first time, her mother's huge four-poster would hold two people who enjoyed their union. As she tidied it, she wondered how many frustrating nights her father had known, how many rejections she had received from her emotionally virgin virginal mother. Well, tonight you're in some, for some surprises, she told the bed as she gave the comforter a final pat. It responded with a crack, with a creak, as though in shocked protest. 
But now she paced the station nervously. She wondered if it, this had been wise. Everyone in Lawrenceville would know Leon was here, staying at her house. So what? Once she sold the house, she'd never return. Damn the town. Who cared what they thought? She heard the wheeze of the local as it rumbled down the tracks. She saw him first. A light snow was drifting down, and it settled on his back. Black hair as he walked down the platform. She felt that strange tightening in her chest. She always felt it every time she saw Leon. Would there ever be times she would take him for granted and relax in the comfort that he belonged to her? Now as she saw his quick smile of greeting, she felt the same surge of amazement that this magnificent man did belong to her. He had come all the way to Lawrenceville just to be with her. I didn't believe I'd ever get here, he said, hugging her lightly. The town was we passed. Good God, I'll bet no one knows there's a Rome in Massachusetts or Lawrenceville, she said. Everyone knows about Lawrenceville. You made it famous. How do we get to the ancestral mansion by sleigh? She led him to a cab. She snuggled against him as they stared out at the countryside. Shouldn't we tell him where to go, she whispered. Mr. Hill knows where everyone in town lives. If you had arrived alone, he would automatically have taken you to the inn. He smiled. I like that, a bit different from New York cabbies. Say, this is a beautiful country. The snow helped, she said without enthusiasm. When did it start? It was clear in New York, she shrugged. Probably in August. It snows here all the time. He put his arm around her. Won't, won't give in, will you? Once you hate something, you're relentless. I gave Lawrenceville 20 years. That's long enough for any small town. Leon leaned forward. Do you like Lawrenceville, Mr. Hill? The driver cocked his head. Uh, yeah, why not? Born here? It's a right ta nice town. Miss Annie's just getting through some grown up growing pains. She'll change. Once she's back long enough, she'll... I told you I was leaving for good, Mr. Hill. I reckon when the time really comes to sell the old house, you'll change your mind. I remember when your mother was born right in that same house. I bet your little ones will be born there, too. Of course, now we got that big new hospital right in Weston, just eight miles down the main highway. Better in a lot of your New York hospitals. Why, Boston had to send for our iron lung during the polio epidemic. The cab crunched through the snow in the driveway and stopped before the house. Leon stepped outside stared st and stared silently. This is yours, he turned to her, his eyes beaming with admiration. And it's beautiful. Picture us in the snow, she said balefully. He paid Mr. Hill, wished him Merry Christmas, and followed her inside. Anne was forced to admit the crackling fire made the large living room appear warm and inviting. She gave him a complete tour, and his eyes shone in approval of everything he saw. She knew he was not just being polite. He, gently liked, he genuinely liked the house. They cooked steaks in the large ki kitchen and ate before the fire in the living room. Leon insisted on building a fire in the fireplace in the bedroom. She was surprised at his agility with the fire irons. You forgot I spent most of my life in London where they don't believe in central heating, he reminded her. Then he said, this is a wonderful house. You've been too close to it. You've, you've been too close to it to appreciate it. It suits you, you know. You look like you belong here. Don't even say that jokingly, she threatened. I don't regard it as a compliment. Uh, on Sunday, the snow stopped and they took a long walk. They ran into half the town just leaving church. She waved but did not stop, and she felt a barrage of curious stares as they continued their walk. When they returned to the house, Leon worked on the fire, and Anne brought him some sherry. It's the only thing I could find, she said apologetically. Not an ounce of whiskey. You're a fallen woman, he said as he sipped his drink. I saw your neighbors stare. They'll check at the inn and find out I'm not registered. Looks like I'll have to marry you quickly, restore your honor in this town. I don't care what this town thinks of me. He sat down beside her. Come on, my stubborn little New Englander. Give in and admit this is really a marvelous house. What a wonderful room. The portrait over the fireplace. Isn't that, sar isn't that a sergeant? Hi, Lady Tim. Um, I think so. It's my grandfather. I'm sending it to one of the galleries in New York. They've offered a good price. Hold on to it. The price will go up. He was quiet for a moment. And seriously, sitting here, you've never looked so beautiful. 
This is such a perfect setting for you, and you don't look the least bit depressed to me. Lawrenceville seems to agree with you. Only because you're here, Leon. You mean home is where the heart is? He held her close, and they both looked at the fire. After a while, still staring dreamily at the burning logs, he said, it just might work at that. What might work? Us. He snuggled closer. I've always said it would. You might as well stop struggling. It's inevitable. I've, I have around $6,000, and what are the taxes here each year? Here? Couldn't be too steep. Remember, I said I couldn't be married to you and let you support me, but I could accept the hospitality of this fine house. With my 6000 we could manage for a year, and if I get a decent advance on the book, I could start another, and it could work. He stood up and rubbing his hands together, looking around the room. Good Lord, it really... It would really be marvelous, huh? And I could write here, here, the word stuck in her throat, and he knelt on the floor. Nothing has been very proper about our relationship, but here, in this very fine and proper house, I will propose in a most proper fashion, on bended knee, will you marry me? Of course, but do you mean you want me to keep the house so you could come here and write? I'll be glad to, but it would take so long to get here each weekend. We live here, Anne. It's your house, but I could pay taxes on it, buy food. I'll be supporting you. One day I'll make enough money to add it to some and add to it in some way. That's probably what your father did. Mr. Hill said your mother was born here. We'll have roots, Anne, and I'll make it. I'll be a damn fine writer. You'll see. Live here. She looked at him wildly. I'll go back to New York and give Henry notice for both of us. If you like, we can get married in New York. Jennifer is there. Everything is there. Nothing we can't live without. But Leon, I hate it here. I hate this town, this house. For the ter first time, he became aware of her panic. Even with me, he asked carefully. She began to pace the room, trying desperately to collect her thoughts. She had to make him understand. Leon, you say you could write here? You probably could, perhaps eight hours a day. But what would I do? Join the women's club? Play bingo once a week? Renew my so-called friendships with the dreary girls I grew up with? And they wouldn't accept you that quickly, Leon. You're an outsider. You have to be third generation Lawrenceville to mean anything to this snobbish town. His face relaxed. So that's what you're worried about? I'd be ostracized. Well, don't worry. I have a tough hide. We'll go to church, be seen around. After they realize we mean to stay, they'll lose up. They'll loosen up. No, no, I won't do it. I won't live here. Why, Anne? His voice was very quiet. Leon, don't you understand? Just as you have certain principles, you couldn't let me support you in New York. Well, I have my blind spots, too. Not many, in fact, just one. Lawrenceville. I hate it. I love New York. Before I came to New York, I lived here in this mausoleum. I was nothing. I was dead. When I came to New York, it was like a veil lifting. For the first time, I felt I was alive, breathing. But now we have each other. His eyes was di were direct, questioning. But not here, she said with a moan. Not here. Can't you understand? A part of me would die. Then, as I see it, you could only love me in New York, sort of a package deal. I love you, Leon. The tears were running down her face now. I'd love you anywhere, and I'd go anywhere that your work took you, any place but here. And you wouldn't even be willing to chance it a year or two? Leon, I'll sell the house. I'll give you all the money. I'll live in one room with you, but not here. He turned and poked at the fire. I suppose that settles it, then he said. I'd better put another log on the fire before I leave. It's dying. She looked at her watch. It's early yet. I'd best take the four o'clock train. Tomorrow's a rough day, and with Christmas coming up on Wednesday, I'll go with you to the station. She went to the phone and called Mr. Hill. The fire was almost out when she returned. Without Leon, the room suddenly looked forbidding and bleak. Again, oh God, did Leon understand? He had been so quiet on the drive to the station. I'll be back on Tuesday, she had promised. Nothing will keep me from being with you on Christmas. But when he got but when he got on the train he didn't he hadn't returned and waved. 
she felt as if she were going to be sick. Damn Lawrenceville. It was like an octopus reaching out and trying to drag her down. Jennifer called the next day. She and Tony were living at the Essex house in a very nice suite. Miriam had taken a room down the hall, and Miriam had acted very nice about the whole thing. They were leaving for the coast tomorrow, uh, January 2nd. They were leaving for the coast earlier now, January 2nd. When Anne was coming back, back, they were giving a big Christmas Eve party tomorrow night. I'll be there, Anne promised, but it looks as if things will never be settled here. I spoke to Henry a few days ago. He's been wonderful, says to take as long as I need, but I'm coming in for Christmas. When Leon calls tonight, I'll tell him about the party. We'll see you then. Leon didn't call that night. He was probably sulking. This was their first fight, except for that misunderstanding in Philadelphia. Well, she wouldn't give in, but she'd phone him at the office tomorrow and tell him she was taking the train at noon. She put the call through at 10 in the morning. Henry wasn't in the office, neither was Leon. She spoke to George Bellows. I didn't know where Leon is, George told her. No one tells me anything around here. Leon came in yesterday and took off at noon. Henry left for the coast on Friday, an emergency with Jimmy Grant show. Maybe he sent for Leon. Like I said, no one tells me anything. She unpacked her bag. No use going to New York. She felt disappointed, mingled with relief. Leon had probably left for California. That's why he hadn't called. At least he wasn't angry. He'd probably call the night that night and sh explain. She spent Christmas Eve alone. Leon didn't call. At three in the morning, she tried his apartment. Maybe he hadn't gone to the coast. Maybe he was sulking. There was no answer. It was the worst Christmas she could remember, and she held Lawrenceville personally responsible. There were no more logs for the fireplace, so she turned the oil burner up. The house was well heated, but cold and dead. She sipped tea. She ate a few crackers. The radio didn't quite drown out the endless chiming of the church bells, and the Christmas carols depressed her even more. This was the day to rejoice, and she was alone. Jennifer was with Tony. Neely was in California with Mel, but she was alone in Lawrenceville. She spent the next few days with Mr. Walker. Everything was tagged, and gradually some order prevailed. She would be free to leave at the end of the week. But where was Leon? Five days had passed. In desperation, she tracked Henry down at the Beverly Hills Hotel in California. Henry, where's Leon? That's what I'd like to know, his voice crackled through the wires. Isn't he out there with you? No, I assumed he was with you. I haven't seen or heard from him since Sunday. You're kidding. Henry was suddenly concerned. I called the office yesterday afternoon, George said he hadn't been in since Monday. I just naturally assumed he took off to spend Christmas with you. Henry, we've got to find him. Why, is anything wrong? I mean, what could be wrong? A guy doesn't just disappear. I've tried his apartment three nights in a row. He's not there. I'll be back tomorrow, Henry. Find him. Find him. She was suddenly frightened. Now calm down. You have, you two have a lover's quarrel. Not really a misunderstanding, but I didn't think it was this serious. I'll be back tomorrow, too, Henry told her, unless the weather is bad. I'm booked on a four o'clock plane this afternoon. Now relax. Leon wouldn't just run out on us. He'll probably be a Monday with a logical explanation. Why don't you relax there over the weekend? Relax? I can't wait to get out of here. She arrived back in New York to find a letter from Leon waiting at her hotel. Dear Anne. Thank you for the of reckoning. I should say the five hours of reckoning. It was quite a long train ride and gave me sufficient time to think things out. If I want to write, there's only one thing to do, write. Until now, I was constantly searching for excuses. I had to work for Henry, then your house, the perfect setting. Seems I want things tied up in a neat bundle. Want the entire world to conform so I can write. Now, who the hell am I? Kind of cheeky attitude, wanting to slink about like the self-sacrificing little author's wife one reads about. As I see it at the moment, I am in limbo. I am not the driving Leon Burke that Henry once knew, but neither am I the dedicated writer. I see nothing ahead but half truths, half author, half an author, half a manager, putting off leaving Henry until I'm commercial success as a writer putting off marriage because I cannot be a full-time husband, 
putting off writing because I must stay with Henry. Until now, I have only given a part of myself to you, Henry, in writing. It's obvious I'm not capable of giving to all three. If not, I should at least pull out of the lives of the two people I care most about. I have written most of these same thoughts to Henry. George Bellows is a good man. He is the man for Henry. And somewhere in your wonderful New York, my dearest, there is the right man for you, just waiting for you to find him. I told you I have a bit of money. I also have access to a large unheated house in, north of, in the north of England. It belongs to relatives, to, but no one uses it. I shall open a few rooms, and I could live there for a few years on a few quid, and I shall write even if my knuckles turn blue. We have only a few hours of daylight during the winter. Lawrenceville is the tropics in comparison, but no one will disturb me. I have enclosed the keys to my apartment, dear Anne. It is the one practical thing I can do for you. With Jennifer married, you are alone, and a flat is still hard to find. And I did inherit this with all the furniture due to your largesse. I think it only fitting that you wind up with it. It's not much. I've taken your wonderful gift, the typewriter. But if the flat pleases you, take over the lease. And don't do anything silly like waiting for me. I warn you, I shall marry the first plump British maiden who will cook and tend for me. And years from now, if I do turn out any book that is halfway good, we can both say, at least there was one thing he did wholeheartedly. I loved you, Anne. But you are too wonderful to accept such a small part of a small person who tried to scatter himself in so many directions. So I shall concentrate on writing, at least in the way I can't hurt no one but myself. Thank you for the most wonderful year of my life. Leon. Whoa, he broke up with her. We'll stop there. It's at page 248. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Valley of the Dust. He broke up with her and moved to England. The nerve of him. Men. <laughs> so we are reading and we will pick up probably tomorrow. And this is my lip balm. This is my shout out. I bought it at Burlington Coat Factory and I bought a whole, there was probably 12 in the package for like two and a half dollars. But I use it on that split. It's the only thing that works. And uh, it tastes good. It's probably too good. It tastes like candy. And this is my product placement. Is I've never heard of this brand, but it's lotion. The price was right, and it doesn't have any fragrance. Not at all. It's no fragrance whatsoever, and that was why I bought it. I don't want fragrance in the lotion. It competes with my fragrance that I wear. And an update on this product placement. They were a huge hit. This is how I cook. I open a can. And you can put toothpicks and olives, and then you have hors d'oeuvres. So bingo, presto. <laughs> Everybody loves an olive. I love them. I put a little piece of cheese with it. Mm, just lovely. So I hope you have a wonderful day. It's Thursday, which is Friday Eve. And it is, let's see, it's 10 a.m. And I hope you have a great day. Let me know you are here so I'll watch your videos. Bye. Big kiss.